Thank you again. This is the second of five in the series. Um, it's very kind of you to credit me with the being the instigator of that. Um, I'm glad I've instigated something worthwhile for a change. Um, just before we get into the whole session properly, there are a couple of um, announcements. First is that um, Des very cleverly organised this date because it's the 192nd anniversary of the laying of the foundation stone of Glenarm Bridge. Um, Oh, that we look so well that old, um, and uh, it's just just happened to be a coincidence that coincident that the fifth of May was the date the foundation stone was laid by um, the Countess of Antrim in that year. The other thing too is that in the course of this, um, you'll hear me mentioning flint. Now you, you probably all know what flint is, but uh, it is particularly uh, prevalent along the Antrim coast. And you, as you drive along, you can see these kind of dotted lines black dotted lines in the middle of the white limestone, and that is the presence of flint. Uh, a close-up view of it will show you just how detailed uh, these things can be. Some of them are quite sizable chunks. It's also known as chert, and the geologists don't really know how it's formed or why it came about, but people working in limestone up until very recent times considered it the bane of their lives because it was so hard that it destroyed machines in, you know, ten times as fast as, as processing all, in other places that didn't have uh, flint uh, would have taken. So just when you mention, when you hear mention, uh, the mention of flint, it was uh, extracted in the 19th century as a saleable commodity. Uh, it was something that Eglinton decided to, to export. Uh, its uses are quite limited, and you know you've heard of flint locks and all that type of thing, uh, but there, there was a ready market for it for quite some time. Okay, so Today's talk is the limestone town of Glenarm, quarries and quarries, and um, I would like to start by kind of going back to a time when a, uh, a much more literary gentleman than I uh, gave his impressions of, of first arriving in Glenarm. And the gentleman was, as you may know, um, William A. P. Thackeray, and the romantically uh, picturesque uh, picture that he paints um, stands in scornful um, contradiction to my own initial first visit. So, not for me the crimson flames burning in the, in the night time, or not for me the companionship of carters waiting early in the cold morning for their first collection of burnt limestone to be off uh, earlier than their competitors. Oh no, that was not my story. My story was completely different. My story was an encounter with a lorry driver and a mechanical shovel digger who decided the road in Glenarm was theirs and that the tourists were a passing inconvenience. Um, there was a, a, an exchange of words, uh, mostly on their part I have to say, but it left me feeling, oh, that's a nice welcome. Um, anyway, I, I got over it rather quickly and drove around over the bridge and down by the side of the church <coughs> over here, I'm um, sorry, this is here, I've stopped. Uh, and that allowed me a view uh, of the site, the, the, the hills in the background. And here, down the side of what was the old uh, Glenarm Works, this building here, here is the old quay. And this was the place where limestone export first began from Glenarm. Okay. So when I was there, I reflected on the fact that okay, that guy was a bit brusque and all the rest of it. Really, this isn't an industry that uh, was noted for its subtlety or grace. It didn't have its own version of the Queen's Free Rules. This was an industry where unremitting toil, where men with bodies and work ethics as hard as the rock that they excavated, grafted, 25, 50, 60 hours a week for a very, very small amount of money, even by this, the remuneration standards of the time. And these were guys who were constantly used to the hard touch, all of the time. Uh, the, the, really the, the epitome of graft, if you will. And it reminds me of, of the, the words of, of one of Dominic Bain's songs, where um, I, I've uh, Grafted hard and they've got me cards and many a ganger's fist across my ears. And in Glenarm, that might not have been an altogether alien experience. 
This event was on the 22nd of August 1976. Uh, at that time, the, the warmest summer recorded in Northern Ireland. And the rains that had come from the north uh, were very, very quickly absorbed by the desiccated landscape. Uh, and so the brilliant white shroud that uh, coated New Road and all the rest of Glenarm was uh, remade anew very, very quickly. This was a time when the grip uh, we paint black lines in the middle of the road, uh, would still have drawn a wry smile from a passerby. Uh, the fact of the matter was that in these days, um, the very first murmurings of the environmental lobby were only just being heard. <coughs> and little did they know that at that time, um, 20 years later, I would have had a tiny contribution to make to that environmental renaissance when the whole of the uh, former uh, Whiting Mill site was vacated and the entire works was moved to Moody Road and the, and the domain party. Massive operation, £10 million investment, uh, and I ate that much of it, which was a great treat, um, and from which I learned an awful lot. Okay, so <clears throat> I'd just like to um, look at another one of those images again, and if I may, and fill in for you. Um, some uh, background detail information that, that might make the rest of the talk a little bit more uh, meaningful for you. Let's start with the blue line here. This is uh, known as the LAID, L-A-Y-D-E, and it was a, a mill race or water course that came from the top of the glen to feed uh, one of the first uh, innovations in motive power that was uh, brought into the limestone operation. 1857, there was a wheel commission the previous year in Scotland and shipped through Red Bay and brought to Glen Arm and installed in January 1857. And that became the main processing uh, medium for quite some period of time. Now bear in mind, at this stage there was no dynamite, there was no blasting. Men were taking out hard stones, big stones, with picks and shovels and wheelbarrows and all the manual tools that you can imagine. This a um, new source of motive power was a massive transformation in their lives and in the ability to produce uh, additional quantity of limestone. Okay, that's one. Um, the other thing that I uh, want to point out is, sorry, the, here, just this little white line that you see, um, was housing that was built uh, by the company for its uh, management of things and uh, has now been uh, rebuilt in a similar style as 21st century housing. Um, so they weren't all bad. The other thing here is along this line um, shows the absence of quite a sophisticated uh, array of narrow gauge uh, tramway. And tramways uh, from the very beginning had played an important, an important part in the uh, operation and industrial archaeology of the entire site. Uh, here we have um, several arrows going, pointing off to these deposits of material from the, from the, the top of the face. That um, happened because in those days they didn't have um, a process known as, as benching. Um, I used to say at this point that I do another roll pass here, but that doesn't go down well these days. Um, <laughs> the cliff face would have been like this, and as you began to work, stone would have been extracted. Okay, so that uh, after a certain period of time, you would have this type of formation. Okay, then again, you could start working here. Okay, and you'd end up with, and so on until you got to the quarry floor. <coughs> the rationale here was that, although this is not called the scale, that, that this distance, this distance here, would be uh, greater than this, this height. So that if anything fell, from, either from the face itself or from the top of it, it would fall into this space. Okay? Make sense? Okay. That meant then, of course, that had that happened here, someone in working in this location would have been safe. 
So the whole idea of benching was something that evolved through industry practice and health and safety didn't even have a word in. <laughs> um, you can see that um, at this point that, hadn't, that wasn't part of their practice um, and so the uh, what's called the overburden is there's a, a layer of basaltic rock, basalt on top of the limestone and that and the earth above it is known in the industry as uh, overburden and the overburden is prone to collapse when the workings start and slide down over the top because rain and so forth loosens it and what have you. So um, it loses its integrity and it begins to fall down. You can see that there have been a number of falls there uh, where the overburden has just collapsed and some of the limestone as well. Some of it also um, in the far corner there is um, here is processed debris or it's the stone that they rejected. Um, and um, probably somebody in there looking for quarter stones but the um, the um, general point that I wanted to show you was that um, these were changes and I hope that it gives you uh, a little bit of infill and background to <coughs> what we're going to talk about later on. Just before I leave this, um, that's the old wedding mill there uh, in a fair state of development at that point. Okay, so uh, if we look at the very first uh, edition of the ordinance, sorry, we can see that here um, the uh, quarry is uh, quite well extended, considering that at that point um, the coast road uh, hasn't been developed. You see, there's no um, keep doing the press, press the wrong one, sorry. There's no uh, bridge here, right, which is where the where the, um, the actually there is. We started doing it, but it's before the coast road was fully developed in any case. Um, in 1823, the Reverend G.N. Wright was talking about Glenarm and he indicated that at that time there were both salt works and limestone quarries in the 1820s in Glenarm. Now, salt, salt industry is evidenced all along the Antrim coast. The relics of it are evidenced along the Antrim coast. It was quite a big um, industry because it had a premium and when the, the tax uh, and the premium were abolished, the trade fell into decline and eventually within a few short years have ceased to exist at all. That meant that the emphasis then shifted to uh, maximizing what could be gained from the other existing industry which was limestone. Okay, so that's one factor. The other one was that when, the, when there had already been uh, a significant trade, coastal trade with Scotland even before the road was opened up, in fact it was the way of trading was by sea. And uh, that was further developed when the roads came along. It didn't take away from the coastal trading. It added to it because it opened up the whole hinterland right up into Mid Antrim, and therefore people could bring um, goods to the port, and that increased the, the volume of throughput in the port itself. Um, very early in the Ordnance Survey of Memoirs, it was recorded that there was something like um, 100 sailings uh, in a year. Um, out of the port, which is too weak, which for a small port of that is pretty big business. So the whole thing opened up and therefore the ability to take out uh, more limestone um, increased and supply and demand began to interact and the more they could take out the more people wanted and so the thing began to move along at a rate of knots which um, has, which continued pretty much unabated for the rest of the 19th century. Okay. Um, the <coughs> um, development then um, meant that Lord Antrim, who had the Whiting Mill originally and who had been responsible for most of the processing, could, without giving very much away, and in fact by gaining, could create leases because there was so much limestone around the place that he couldn't possibly process all of it. So if he decided to let other people have a go at the same resource, then he could, he could take his, his um, rental from the leases uh, and actually make money without having to do any work for it. Nice way to be. So um, leases began to proliferate and various people became involved in the extraction process from an arm and this again added to the uh, transit routes being more utilised and the coastal routes being more utilised and so it became a really bustling port. Now the whole issue with um, leases is really quite complicated. There are still about 40,000 documents in Prony that 
I don't think very many people have had a look at yet that tell us more about this story. So we're a bit down the line before we actually get something like an answer on it, but I'll get there in the end, um, and uh, <coughs> I hope. Um, in the meantime, what I've done is I have taken um, abstracts from uh, some leases to give you an indication of a timeline of what happened during different periods of ownership. Are we okay with this so far? Not going too fast? Making sense? Oh, that's good. <laughs> Makes a change. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the, nearly all of these people, um, bar one very significant one, uh, were Scotsmen. Uh, because of the trading links with Scotland and because they were aware of the product and because the uh, communication channels were open and the trading relationships existed, um, Scottish capitalists were quite keen to, to get a piece of this action. And the very first one um, was a gentleman known as Hugh Donaghy. Now he had a very successful um, operation in Glasgow, um, so he had capital to invest, and he had the experience um, to invest in an industrial enterprise. And so he came along and around the 1840s um, set up the Glenarm Flint and Whiting Company and began trading and traded quite successfully, built the business, built the infrastructure of the business um, to a point where he could then uh, pass over to his son a business valued at that time at a, estimated at around £2,000. That's a considerable amount of money, represents a considerable investment and therefore um, suggests and almost proves that there was significant profit to be made in the industry and that that was being done on a regular basis. During um, the son, uh, Charles Donaghy's tenure, um, his father got into some difficulty with his Glasgow operation, and the whole business became um, involved in a, in a complicated um, process in the Scottish courts. The upshot of that was that the, um, the Scots courts, because they operated under Roman law, um, they issued a sequestration order on this business, in other words, they seized his assets. And a few gentlemen, uh, led by one Robert Robertson, uh, came across uh, on the 15th and 16th of March, uh, 1866, to um, seize the Glenarm assets. Now, Mr. Charles Donaghy was obviously not best pleased with this. And long story short, fisticuffs ensued, and they were all hauled off to attend the quarter sessions in Ballymena the following October. And they did. And uh, eventually, when it came to trial, um, Mr. Donaghy had very wisely retained the well-known um, Belfast solicitor, Mr. John Ray, uh, to, to defend the action on his behalf. Um, the, um, local newspaper, the Ballymena Observer, Northern Ad Advertiser, uh, neatly um, summarizes the trial in a single paragraph, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just quote it to you. <clears throat> Mr. John Ray, solicitor for Mr. Donaghy, with his usual ingenuity and taste for declamation, managed to spin out the proceedings so as to occupy the entire Friday and a considerable portion of Saturday to the great annoyance and very inconvenient delay of many suitors. The jury were unable to agree upon a decision and they were ultimately discharged without a verdict. Um, so Ray had wasted all of the court's time, they were out of time, nobody else, no other cases could be heard, and there's no more time to spend on the case. So basically the judge said, catch yourselves all and sort it out. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's not quite uh, clear from the records that I had access to at this stage, ultimately what happened. But uh, the Donaghy's, in the fullness of time, left the scene and one of the few local people that came on the scene at that point um, was a man called Daniel Hanna, a Glenarm merchant. And he entered into um, a, a lease, he entered into a number of leases, actually he entered into a lease with, uh, with uh, Lord Antrim in 1858, at which point he acquired this site. Now, a few very interesting things here that are not marked but uh, are interpretable. First thing is that these circles here are kilns, and I'll show you a photograph of an example of one of that, one of those in just a moment. 
You can see the extent of the, the uh, tramways they have all around. This is coming down to um, here. And this is the location for the little archway at the bottom of Mark Street. If you've been through Glen Arm, there's a nice little floral arrangement on the left hand side, and there's the archway still behind it. And that has been time. Okay. Um, and um, that uh, came out across the road and went uh, to the old key, the one that I showed you in the beginning. Um, it indicates the in more detail the extent of the quarry operations, um, which makes it all, all altogether more clear than the Ordnance Survey did. Just along the top is our friend the Laid again, the water course. So that dates this map after 1857, and the leases dated 1858, so that makes sense. And uh, this would be the roadway pretty much um, as it is today, maybe slightly wider today, but basically that's it. Now there's um, one of the kilns. A pretty massive uh, piece of construction by anybody's reckoning. Very, very impressive in flesh, so to speak. <coughs> and these were always built into uh, a hillside or an incline because they were top loaded. So the, the, the um, deposits would have been filled from the top. So you'd have intervening, uh, intermittent layers of uh, limestone rock and whatever combustion fuel, be it uh, coal or peat or wood or whatever it was. Uh, and those would be interlayered and burned in the course of the night. And as they burned, the stone became hot, um, cracked as a result, and uh, became powdery. Uh, and then when they got to the bottom, it was simply a question of separating out the, the burning medium ash from the limestone, which was usually pretty easy to do, and taking out the lime early in the morning, which would have been still pretty hot, a couple of hundred degrees at that stage, and they still shoveled it out. Again, no protection. Uh, no breathing apparatus, nothing. You got your shovel, you got your bar, and away you went. Okay, because there were people waiting to get their supply to get off. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would have been quite early in the morning, very often. So the whole thing was set off uh, early in the evening, burnt during the night, and the, the uh, produce was taken out in the morning time. Okay, um, so that um, is the ground plan of the photo on the right. This was the second of Daniel Hammond's leases and you can see that at this point there is a colossal investment in the, uh, the, the building structures around uh, the whole industry. Okay, so things are really, really moving fast. Along uh, this line here were stables because there were quite a lot of horses in use and if you went there, now that wall there, most of it is still in place, the roof is gone of course, um, but in that wall, you can still see the recesses for the joists for the roof timbers for the stables uh, used to be They're still in place. Just a little bit of uh, social history in passing. The bell there, um, and local folklore was said to come from a ship that foundered in the bay. Don't know about that, uh, but it's a nice story. Uh, that bell regulated not only the working day, so when work started, when your lunch breaks began and ended, when your day ended, and so forth, but it became almost um, a community timepiece. <coughs> so everyone would know that, you know, when the final bell went at six o'clock, if you had to get the dinner ready, you need to get your skates on, you know. So, so the whole, but the whole of um, six of the days uh, in the week were regulated by the, <coughs> the company's bell. And it was a very important position. In fact, there were people local, locally who vied for the position of uh, of being a bell person. Um, and one of the most vociferous in pursuit of the, of the job, the job was a woman, uh, for reasons best known to herself, but did the job very, very well for a simple period of time. The other thing about it too is that during the war, um, it served as uh, an area warning device for, for Glen Arm Village and surrounding district. When it ran, you could hear it across the bay, it almost a car log, so it was quite a useful um, warning device at that stage. <coughs> okay, um, that is um, still a, a good deal of the perimeter uh, material still in existence there uh, and there are various proposals currently to decide what may or may not happen to it but it's, I mean, every time you go down there there's a new story, nobody knows. Okay, now 
Daniel Hannan was supposed to have taken on uh, the construction of a pier because the, really at this stage the volume business was such that the old pier had really ceased to function effectively. Um, that would have been there where the ship is. Clearly not enough. What was available, they, they had uh, extended the pier along here and even that was not enough because when the bridge was built it precluded ships from going up the back of Tober Wine Street and therefore the amount of space, the amount of berthing uh, that was available here was, was very restricted, uh, far um, below what was required for the volume of traffic and so a harbour was badly needed. You can see from the description here that it's referred to as Mr. Reed's um, uh, harbour. Now Mr. Reed um, came on the scene uh, again, another Scotsman. He had uh, come from a stoneworks in Gifnock uh, in, in Scotland um, and he is credited with supplying the stone for the first um, suspension bridge across the Clyde. So clearly a significant contract, successful man, used onions and came across with a fair amount of, of venture capital to be able to say, okay, let's see what I can do with this. So in the fullness of time, he uh, engineered and built uh, the harbour and before too long, uh, it, was, it was being fully utilised. <coughs> so that was a major uh, contribution to his effort and um, generated even more business and greater success and greater profits for him. Incidentally, just in passing, this uh, drawing uh, is taken from a, a much bigger, a big AO drawing. Uh, and to the right of that, there was a whole series of absolutely beautiful uh, villas, which were intended, it was, a, it was a development scheme where they intended to um, utilize Glenarm resources as a kind of a holiday village, uh, which arguably, sadly, uh, never came to pass. But it's a, it's a lovely, lovely drawing, have it at home. And um, I just happened to spot this uh, useful little bit of evidence in the bottom here, uh, Mr. Reed's um, harbour. The, the ad that appeared in the local paper um, basically says it all. I mean, as, as ads go, this is pretty much um, the, the zenith of, of 19th century PR. You know, the whole the confidence underlying the thing, look, we, you name it, we can do it, you know. Um, and they taking the opportunity to advertise the fact that the harbour and course of construction is very nearly there. And knowing full well that people looking at that advertising material would appreciate the significance of that and be more attracted to, um, to come to, to utilise the port uh, for, for their supplies. Tremendous piece of advertising, very, very well put together. And it, stand, it literally stands out. I mean, even looking at the old newspapers, it physically stands out when you turn the page. Great piece of work. Mr. Reid um, was, was a very benign man, he was a very enlightened man and, and he took a great deal to do with the, the whole community. Anything that could benefit the company, anything that could benefit the village, anything that could benefit his employees, benefit his business, he saw this, what today would be called um, social responsibility, corporate <coughs> social responsibility, as a key feature in his ongoing success. Now for the time that was a really enlightened attitude. There's very, very little evidence of that to be found anywhere else. And um, there was, uh, when he died in 1901, 1901 he, sorry, he retired um, around the 1870s and went back to Scotland, didn't settle in his native land because he had become so um, utterly in, in love with County Antrim that he, came, he left Scotland again and came back uh, and built his final home um, in Larne with a nice view of the harbour and the distant Scottish hills and all the rest of it. And he stayed there until his death in 1901. Now in his obituary, um, it says that uh, he settled in Glenarm where he developed the extensive quarries there, engineering and constructing the harbour and taking an active interest in anything that was for the advantage of the town and district. And here's the key bit. He was not very long in possession of the works and he interested himself in the welfare of his workmen and without their solicitation, without their solicitation, they didn't have to go and strike for it, increasing their wages and providing them with a better uh, pay and more modern tools. Now, 
To me, the more modern tools is every bit as important as the better pay. He's making the job easier and paying them more for doing it. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, up until that point, uh, because people were so um, afraid of losing their jobs, the whole idea of industrial action just it never ever occurred. And looking back at it, I suppose Mr. Reed created a two-edged sword because he created within his employees a sense of self-worth, a sense that there was some correlation between what they did and what they could pay for and how they did it and how much they could pay for what they did. Um, that ultimately it filled its way through into the industrial relations um, arena. But at that time was um, was really uh, a very enlightened approach. Okay, um, when um, he had run the business for uh, about 15, 15 16 years, um, he did a deal with a company called the Edinburgh Chemical Company in Irvine in Scotland, um, whereby he he sold his, uh, basically sold the business to them but retained a right to it. So uh, legally it's called an interest in possession but uh, so he was still getting uh, income from the business which was part of the purchase price so to speak. So he could still take most of the profits but the actual ownership, um, the legal ownership of the business was vested in this company. When he eventually decided to retire in his, in his late 50s, um, Eglint moved in, the Eglint Chemical Company moved in. And they created um, a whole new uh, work environment. They had extensive, extensive connections um, across the water, particularly with the steel industry. The demands for the type and quality of product uh, changed. So there were new skills had to be acquired, there were new uh, operating processes, methods that needed to be installed and these all became um, something of a, of a working culture shock for the local inhabitants, local employees. Anyway, it was proceeded with a pace and um, at that time uh, was managed by uh, another benign gentleman called uh, Walter Jemison who uh, also won uh, the love and respect of his, not only his employees, but the, the, the broader community. And that was manifest in the front page report of the great send-off they had from when he, when he decided to leave the company in the late 1870s. Um, one of the things that, one of the few things that I was able to find that uh, verified the existence of somebody called Walter Jemison was this memorandum. You can see it's October 1885. You can see um, that the company had premises at Ballantoy um, and in those premises <coughs> they particularly uh, manufactured limestone sets. You see them down in uh, the likes of Hill Street and Gordon Street and so forth made in granite. These were actually brick type uh, papers that were, that were cut in limestone and they had a whole range of sizes. Now this might not look like much uh, but it actually reflects um, a tremendous product range. So they obviously had key markets um, that they could service with this production and the uh, acquiring the skills to be able to create this output was some of the, um, the, the new uh, skills that, that became uh, part of the of the Glen Hour working routine. That works a trend, uh, change in trend, because some people are obviously move away from the sheer graft and hard work of extracting the stone to a semi-skilled production environment where they were learning to cut stone, learning to shape stone, size stone and so forth. And with that, the underlying education with regard to measurement and angles and so forth. So it had um, deeper consequences than merely just uh, the product range that it represents. I have found nothing else, um, no illustrations, personal documents or anything else about Walter Jemison, except one thing, and that was that the, uh, re the rector, that's not him, of uh, St. Patrick's Church at the time, was a gentleman you may have heard of called the Reverend 
uh, uh, SFW Jans. And in, he kept a, uh, a scrapbook of newspaper cuttings, which I actually have possession of at the moment. And in the uh, scrapbook, beside the notice of Mr. Jemison's retirement, uh, was a manuscript note that said that he had gone to work um, in, uh, in uh, helping Native communities and had unfortunately died in a drowning accident in Tasmania within six months of retiring. Um, so that was, uh, that was the end of poor Mr. Jemison. Anyway, he was succeeded by um, this man, John Jock Thompson. Came from Lanarkshire, uh, uh, came to Glenarm at a fairly early age and remained there for pretty much the rest of his life. He's described as a uh, mining and quarrying engineer and is sometimes uh, named with CE uh, after his name. I have not been able to find any membership record of him being um, a chartered engineer, but um, reading through all the newspaper reports, he obviously had a great deal of, of uh, influence on whoever was, uh, whoever was the local hack. Uh, and the reports of Mr. Thompson, which were frequent, uh, verge on the obsequious. Um, I think if the hack had had his way, Mr. Thompson would have been canonized. But anyway, um, <laughs> doesn't get my vote. Um, I don't know, it, it's probably quite unprofessional for a researcher to, to be uh, emotionally involved <laughs> in, in the people that they're studying, but I don't like this guy, I didn't like him from the start. <laughs> um, uh, Big Chief speaking for tongue is, is, is evidenced in what this man did. But credit where credit is due, uh, he became a JP, uh, he became a county councillor, he became the on-paid, in fact that he always liked to stress, director of technical education for County Antrim, all uh, from its inception until a short time before he died in 1947. Um, all major achievements. The um, belief that he was the greatest thing to slice bread is one that you have, have, probably have to make your own mind up on, but it's, it doesn't work for me. Um, he's buried in um, Glen Arm, what's no, known as the New Cemetery, the cemetery of Glen Arm just <coughs> down Goody Road. Uh, naturally enough, with an obelisk above his grave to make sure that his importance was <laughs> noted. Um, he did, to give him his due again, he did drive the company forward. Uh, he did uh, make significant changes in terms of working process and so forth. One of the things that he did, do you remember I showed you where the railway was absent and then one of the early illustrations, this is the railway present. Um, going back, this is the little tunnel here coming out, going across the road and where it used to go out this way, comes right round, goes right down to the very end of the pier. And you can see here a little um, turntable which allowed the wagons to be brought down, turned around and tipped off the quay into the holes of ships below. All of this um, made a tremendously significant difference in what today would be known as materials handling. So whereas, whereas before it was horses and carts, maybe, or wheelbarrows more often, and people just hopped the stuff around, now they're coming up. And I think I can remember to include, yeah, very poor photograph. This was, uh, I extracted this from, an art, from a, a print uh, way before Photoshop was invented. And you can see there, there are 10 little wagons there, each carrying about uh, 10 tons, so the 100 ton of rock uh, and there are other photographs, if you look at them closely, from towards the end of the 19th century of Glenarm. If you look at them closely, you'll see rakes and rakes and rakes of wagons, 20 or 30 in a row, um, all waiting to be loaded. So this meant that material could be cleared off the site very, very quickly. It also meant that a vast amount of material um, was being produced. And because the shipments were at least two a week, um, they weren't stockpiling. This wasn't stock, this was actually waiting for the next next boat to come in, um, and a lot of the work was done by um, the little coastal ships known as puffers. Um, you know about Neil Monroe and Parahandy and all that stuff, it was all, all that story. Um, he also um, uh, secured the building uh, and acquisition of the company's own ship, the SS Glen Arm, oddly enough, and that um, meant that they could fill bespoke orders. So if some particular client wanted a certain quantity of material, they didn't have to wait for 
the, the poppers that the coastal steamers to come in. They simply um, loaded up their own ship, took it off, delivered it. Now, that had the um, beautiful double-edged sword capacity of breaking the monopoly that the poppers had without breaking the poppers. The poppers still needed to do the business, but they, they lost their stranglehold on the company um, and therefore terms of trade and so forth uh, changed. So it's very typical of what a wily Scotsman might do. He says, thinking, I wonder how many Scots people are here. <laughs> um, anyway, that's, um, that's really um, quite a lot of uh, what I wanted to say um, today. The, just um, towards the end of um, the 19th century, this was more or less the position that faced people. You can see just in passing that over here is another key. This was known as the Iron Ore Key because one of the other uh, endeavours that persisted there for quite a period of time was actually taking iron ore out from the top of the hill, from the, from the top of the peak's point. Um, a lot of things have been extracted from, from Glenarm. Um, there was an attempt to take out bauxite. There was a tiny bit of coal which came and went. Um, the iron ore, as I say, they, were, they, they had different types of silica deposits. Um, somebody was prospecting for silver at one point, somebody else was pro prospecting for magnesium and magnesium at another point. Um, pretty much none of which came to anything because limestone was the business of the day and still is. <coughs> so that kind of um, brings us to pretty much the end of what I wanted to say. Just one thing and, um, to show you the um, second edition of the Ordnance Survey map. This is what, uh, about 40, nearly 50 years on, um, how much the quarry operation had uh, changed, the addition of the harbour. You can see big tramways down there, tramways all through the site. That's the, um, that's the iron ore tramway. There are tramways within. Here you have an engine house marked. Okay. You have a kiln marked there. Um, you can see the lines going out along the harbour. Um, there's a whole array of different things here. The lead you can see here is truncated at this point, um, and uh, that th actually this map itself uh, warrants uh, the study in its own right. You, I, 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 it's probably not just my oddness that would have me looking at it for an hour, but it's well worth 10 or 15 minutes of anybody's time just to pick up the detail that's there. There's a lot of very, very useful information and a lot of insightful um, cues as to what might be going on. Okay, um, the only other thing is that... If